property in, in property and visible goods. If you don't, uh, get out. Um, so it really comes down to a question of is intellectual property property? And I would argue that it's it's really a mislabeling or, or a, a, a propaganda label uh, for something that is not genuinely property. But in order to argue that, I have to say, well, what what is property? How does it come about? Um, in my view, property is a, an emergent system um, you know, developed through the ages in different ways, common law, generally any society has some theory of property. It's meant to deal with scarce and rivalrous goods. So we have things that either I can have or you can have, uh, but we can't both have them at the same time. And we have to figure out a way to, to uh, deal with that and not have conflict. And the only real fair way to do that is to have a generally accepted principle uh, for all of us, hey buddy, for all of us as, uh, as individuals that we can all uh, come to acquire um, s these resources uh, and, and trade them and make use of them. Um, intellectual property uh, is not scarce and rivalrous. Uh, I, you, if you write a song, uh, you can both keep that song and I can also enjoy that song. Um, the medium on which it's transmitted is, so that's a, that's a physical good, uh, but I'm arguing that uh, essentially you can only have property in material goods and that anything that you would build on top of that as, a, as an additional property theory is gonna undermine the uh, original theory of property because um, if I have a, uh, a piece of paper and I look at your sheet music and I start to copy it down onto my sheet of paper, uh, well, if you say that you, you have property in that, in, those, in that writing, in those symbols, uh, then you're telling me what I can do with my pen and my paper. So we're, now we have a system that is non-scarce and rivalrous, um, overriding uh, the actual use of my, my physical property. This creates conflict instead of solving it. Probably is winning. Okay, cool. <laughs> Mr. Zeiler. Zeiler. Is it Zeiler? Yeah. Zeiler. Did I tell you about my idea for your app, the Zeiler phone? Encrypted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Encrypted what? Encrypted uh, VoIP. You know, just, it will oh, be right. the same as Signal, but it's on. just called Zeiler phone. <clears throat> it's like being called. <laughs> okay. Zylerphone.com. Okay. Yeah. Alright. Do it. Well, I don't know what your stance on is on this one, Mike. Um, so the resolution is, and um, so I'll let you choose. <laughs> Age of consent norms are arbitrary. Oh, sorry. You know what? I wanted to argue the other way. There we go. Age of consent norms are based in natural law and are consistent with self-ownership. I, hmm, <laughs> that's a toughie. Uh, age of consent laws are based in natural law and are consistent with self-ownership. I said norms, not laws. Norm. Um, yeah, I think I agree with that. <laughs> Shoot. Well, <laughs> I have three reasons why you are absolutely wrong. I knew you were going to fall into that trap. <laughs> <laughs> well, hold on a second. <laughs> you got to propose the opposite then, but we, we can argue that way. All right. So you're going to propose that age of consent laws are, are against natural law and, um, and the principles of self-ownership. I propose that, or I resolve that age of consent norms are arbitrary preferences and they violate the natural laws of self-ownership. Okay. Um, so how many people uh, agree with that? And we can restate it if you're confused. Oh, okay, so it's age of consent laws uh, violate natural law or against natural law and violate, right? Of self ownership. You, you, go ahead, restate. Yeah, uh, age of consent norms are preferences that violate self ownership and natural law. Okay, is everyone clear on that? Yeah. Okay, so who's, who's agree who agrees with that? Okay, who is neutral? Wishy-washy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
And who is against? This last one? For neutral, I tell it. Wait, wait, put your hands up again. I'm sorry. That's, this is neutral again. I'm sorry, 12. Wait, James, 13. Oh, 12. Go, James. Uh, and who is against? There are dozens of us. <laughs> All right, why don't you make your argument? You have five minutes. <laughs> okay. Youth have agency. Um, children, children, when they're born, don't really own themselves, but as they grow and they mature, they start taking ownership of themselves in various ways. Like, um, once they learn how to look both ways crossing the street, and they demonstrate that they're responsible enough to do that, then they can cross the street. And, um, you know, making their own lunch, once they know how to do that, they prove they can take care of themselves, they understand that they're responsible, then they take ownership of themselves, and no one else can tell them that they don't own themselves at some point. That's, that's how humans develop. And so it starts at a young age with various aspects of themselves. Um, we respect children when they say no, that they don't want something. Um, we say that they, they have agency there. Um, and then often we also respect the children when they say yes, they do want something. So, um, and that applies to a variety of things. I think this topic is talking probably, I mean, it's definitely about sexual interaction um, uh, with consent. And then um, parents are, when, when children take ownership of themselves, parents are more stewards than owners of the children to certain degrees. Um, second point is that consensual uh, interaction, um, be it physical, sexual, in, in various degrees, is not rape, right? In, in, if you're looking at like a criminal rape case, the age of a person doesn't matter. Like if they're 35, you don't, you don't think like this age plays into it. It's really about did they consent and what are the degrees of consent that they have established um, to say that it's consensual interaction versus rape. Um, and so that's, there are many ways to consent and there's many degrees, and so it's not very straightforward that like one age is when people consent to an activity. Um, and then freedom of choice is good for individuals and society. So we, if, if we look at examples of uh, freedom of choice in basically every aspect of, of our lives, we see that it, it tends to improve what people want and improves people's lives. And to, to deny choice of a person based on age, even though they've demonstrated that in various ways that they want to perform some interaction with another human, is denying them choice. And, and often a lot of us are struggling against being denied choice by other people that are outside of our experience. Um, so it's good for society. No one knows what's best for you. So if there's parties um, consenting to something, who, who is it to tell them that they, they can't? Um, and like an, an, an example is in Europe, there's not really a, a drinking age. And from, what, from everything I've, I've heard and learned, children are a lot more responsible and they decide when they want to start drinking how much. In my experience here growing up, or in Texas, there was like a strict drinking age, and it was a very big problem when children reached a certain age that they really wanted to get into it, and it was really dangerous. And uh, the same goes for sex. The same goes for for all kinds of things: massaging, or hugging, or holding hands, whatever it is. Um, so, youth have agency. They can they can consent to all kinds of things at different times. And then they can say no, they can withdraw that consent. Um, consensual sex and rape are totally different, they are totally incompatible, and they have nothing to do with age, it's all about consent. And freedom for people to choose, while some people are going to get hurt, always, it's best for society and individuals to be able to make their own choices and deal with their own questions. Okay. I'm really glad that you phrased this proposition the way you did, and I want to, uh, I want everyone to think about uh, a few key facts. We are not arguing for the state's 
age of consent laws, um, we are arguing, is there a legal principle uh, that we can justify in private law that says that below a certain age, someone is not able to functionally give consent. That even if they express a preference, uh, that engaging in certain activities uh, with that person is still going to be uh, an aggression against them. And I would argue clearly, I think uh, law throughout history has established that there is some line. And I'm not gonna argue that it's not a gradient, and I'm not gonna argue that it's not a difficult question, um, but I am gonna argue that uh, this proposition suggests that there is no age at which uh, it is wrong to um, put someone to work in, a, in dangerous conditions, to, to have sex, uh, to do all sorts of things that um, by the principle of law we would say that this person might not have the mental faculties to give consent as we know it. And this applies not just to age, uh, but to many conditions. Basically, anytime you would see that there's a moral uh, obligation for, for someone to be a, a caretaker, uh, then the person who is being taken care of, we could say, is in, in this condition of not being able to consent. This could be someone who has a mental handicap. Um, this, it, this could be age. This could be someone suffering from dementia. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a clear principle, legal principle, well justifiable, that uh, people in certain states um, have lost the ability to make choices that will affect them in ways that they do not understand. And then that's, that's essentially why, uh, why the legal principle exists. Um, but again, uh, this is not about the state's laws. Uh, we, do, we all agree that the state uh, draws arbitrary and often um, uh, extreme lines. Um, but it is arguing that yes, even in a, pr a private law society, even in a free society, free of aggression, that there will be people that are protected, uh, that whose advocates, whose, whose stewards and caretakers could go to court on their behalf uh, if they are uh, pressured, if they are uh, led into an activity that they cannot fully understand or consent to. Uh, thanks for pointing out that this isn't about um, about laws. Uh, definitely not. Um, and I think there, you're right. There are definitely cases when, you know, very very outlier cases when people have a mental handicap or, or dementia or or something like that, where they most people have established that they can't make decisions for themselves, and that it's clear that they have not established ownership of themselves in any regard. Um, but there are there are tons of very young people who own themselves in many ways. And to, to say that there's an outlier, um, a set of outliers, is not, I don't think, in accordance with the na general natural law that applies to all humans naturally. And. Um, one minute, Steve. Yeah, uh, you say, so no, no courts would decide, uh, if people are generally deciding uh, some, some arbitrary age, there's really no good way to communicate what that age is, or, or even for people to understand what other people's preferences are for an age. Um, and really, it always comes down, almost, almost all the thinking about this problem comes down to the actual people involved. And so to have a general law of consent, even in, in nature, seems, the, the law seems to be that people consent when they're ready. And, and that seems to be the natural law that I see. It's all right, it's your time. Uh, I'm just trying. <laughs> Okay, so uh, you made an exception for people with disabilities. Um, so, uh, you know, presumably that would be by some criteria like, like IQ. Um, and so then it seems like an easy jump to say, well, if someone has a mental handicap that puts them at a, you know, an IQ of 50, um, 
then uh, a child who would measure at the same level uh, would also be in the same category in terms of being able to understand your consent. So I think making that exception, which I think is a reasonable exception, can very easily be applied to, to children. Um, in, in terms of uh, sort of the, the uh, fuzziness of the law, which is a legitimate point if you can't draw a line and people can't know what the law is, I think um, there are some clear indicators and going back to the idea that if someone has a steward, if there is a guardian for this person, um, that is a pretty good indicator that they, have, they are, have something less than their full faculties to be able to make adult choices. Um, and, uh, and the law itself, uh, the common law was established by precedent. So uh, you do come to know, uh, based on cases that are tried in front of a jury of your peers, if, if that's the system that we buy into, um, that over time this, these are what the lines are. Um, certainly uh, uh, maybe more dynamic uh, than statutory law, uh, which is just you know passed in one place and promulgated throughout the land. Um, but it still doesn't undermine uh, fundamentally the principle that a court could find that uh, yes, because of someone's age, they are not able to uh, make an informed decision uh, to engage in certain activities. Shall we read counts? Let's do it. Okay, so everyone for the proposition. I count 12, is that correct? That's plus one for Steve. All right, uh, everyone neutral? I count two. Two. That's one less. And everyone. I'm sorry. What? I apologize. It was 12, so that's negative 10. Okay, and uh, everyone against? It was 3, so clearly... Okay. Stephen, thank you so much. <laughs> if, if I may say, yeah. um, I would, uh, in a voluntary world, I would imagine that if if a child was, if this, there was a really questionable case and there was a child having a sexual relationship with an adult, an adult, and that adult thought it was fine and the child thought it was fine, I think the community would probably have to hold the parent responsible for, for the incident. Um, hmm. Because they're the ones that kind of consented to all those rules and, and agreed. Uh, if there was someone who really didn't agree. That'd be an interesting I discussion know. on As own. far as tactics go. Sure. Thank you so much. On this episode of the Freecast, we're live at FF3 with Borowski on the boat in a prax party. We'll talk about the union leader's love for Johnson, but the Seacoast LP wants to give Gary the shaft, and UNH erects a $1 million stadium sign using funds from a longtime librarian. Nuts. We've got improv theater in the Stone Church selling beer by the leader, all on the Freecast. Woo! Nice job. And I didn't mess it up. <laughs>